In this chapter, we are going to discuss the concept of lists in programming and also have a look at how it is implemented in Java through the Java Collections Framework, JCF. Let's first discuss our incentives. Up to now, while writing your programs, if you needed to store or process a large group of items that are of the same type, you use the data structure we call arrays. For example, if you want to uh, store and process the scores of the students in the exam, you create an array, let's say named scores, copy the score values of all students into this array. And for example, if you need it in a method, you just pass this array variable, a single variable into the method, or similarly, a method could be returning such an array. So it was nice that uh, the array uh, groups related items into a single data structure, which is actually the first advantage of the arrays. The arrays are also uh, useful because it's quite easy to use arrays uh, when you want to access the elements. For example, let's say we have the scores array like this let's say we have 100 students remember we have the index always starting from 0 if we have 100 elements then we know it goes all the way up to 99 now what if I want to access the element with say index four in this array. What I need to do in that case is actually, I need to find this starting place of the element with index four, because starting from here, I know that it would be in this box. So to show where the box is, I need to know the starting address of that element. How do I find that? Well, anyways, the scores address stores the starting address of the whole array, which is also actually the starting address uh, of index zero. Now, if I know the starting address of the array, if I know the index and if I know the size of the individual elements remember all elements are of the same type so they have all the same size so on top of this starting address if I put the size of an element all elements are the same times the index of the element I'm searching for, see, the size of an element is this, and the index in this example was four. So for the element with index four, I have four elements before that one. Since the index starts from zero, there are four elements that come before index four, zero, one, two, and three, there are four of them, okay? So if I know the size of one and multiply it with four, I have four of them, so added to this, this starting address, all the way this, it will give me this starting address, which is what I need, okay? Therefore, Java, uh, or sorry, in general, arrays provide us a fast means of accessing the elements. It's not important whether I'm looking for the element with size, sorry, with index, four or one or 99 it doesn't matter the calculation is the same you take the starting address and uh, add on top of that the index times the size of an array and this is a simple calculation and then you can directly go there and fetch the element that's why the arrays are typically very fast compared to the data structures we are going to discuss uh, in this chapter However, 
the arrays also have their disadvantages. The arrays uh, provide us fast access, but they also require that the programmer at the time of coding, while you're writing the program, you need to know the size of the array. You need to know how many elements you're going to store in the array. In some cases, you already know this when you're writing the code. But in many cases, you don't know what the size of the array will be. Okay, so this constitutes a problem. How do we cope with that? Well, what we do is, uh, we, by writing the code, we try to estimate what the worst case will be and create an array which is typically slightly larger than the worst case to ensure that I never fall into the problem that I'm exceeding the array bounds and live with that. For example, uh, if you consider the registration system of the university, I need to estimate how large a course could be. So, for example, uh, I could say I can have 400, 450 students at most in one very large uh, mass course, like the uh, programming course or mathematics, physics, whatever. So, since my estimation was 400 or, uh, or 450, I create an array of 500. But if in one semester, the number of students in the largest course, say physics, happens to be 510, I will not be able to store the uh, scores of 10 students, which is definitely not acceptable. So I have a problem with my array. So then I say, okay, let me make it 600. But in most cases, in most courses, we have fewer students in the course. Just because of the worst case, we make all arrays for all courses equal to say 600 but in most cases the classes are like 30 40 50 80 100 but rarely it is as large as 400 500 but still i'm wasting too much memory so that's the major problem uh, with the arrays at the time of coding you need to know and specify the size of the array. Also, the arrays are not good when we want to keep uh, the elements in the array sorted. Uh, because, you know, first of all, consider the case why do we need sorted arrays? Well, for example, again in the registration uh, case, I would like to see the list of the students in the course sorted either according to their names or last names or student ID according to something. So in many cases, we need to keep the arrays sorted. And then when a new element is to be added into the array, I need to create a new element in the array and uh, store that new value. But if the array itself is sorted and this new element has to enter somewhere in the middle of the array, all elements after this position should be shifted one position to the right, a hole should be created for this new item, and I put the new item there. Or think about the reverse, like if a student was dropping the course, then I have to find the student's record, which would probably be somewhere in the middle of the array. And when I delete that, there would be an opening there, which I don't want. So I need, I would need to shift all students after that deleted student, one position to the left. And these shift left or right operations typically take too much time and processing. So it causes low performance in the case of arrays. Therefore, we say we need a new a type of a data structure, which is capable of managing in codes, the collections of such items. What we mean as we want to store, again, related items all together in a single data structure. But this data structure should be flexible. I don't know what the size of the uh, that collection should be because I don't know how many elements I will need while I'm writing the code. And also I need 
good performance, especially when I want to insert or delete elements to or from almost the middle uh, of the array. So we come up uh, with the other uh, data uh, types, which will be altogether called a collection. Now, we are first going to focus on the list type of collections. So a list in general is a collection or a configuration of nodes. Uh, but this collection may grow or shrink as we need, as we discussed in the previous slide. So this will circumvent the first disadvantage, which meant we need to know the size of the collection when we are writing the code. Now we can implement a list in two different ways. One option is making uh, or implementing it as what we call an array list. In the case of an array list, actually there's still an array behind, but the programmer does not see that. The programmer creates a data structure called array list, but Java will create an array for the programmer without showing it to the programmer. To the programmer, it appears like he or she has a, an array list of size zero. So the programmer may add or remove elements as he or she wishes. Behind Java will manage all these over an array. But this is still subject to the second disadvantage, which was the low performance uh, of random insertion and deletion operations. An alternative implementation for a list could be rather than an array list, this time what we call a linked list. So here we don't have the elements sitting side by side in the case of an array in the memory next to each other. Instead, in the case of a linked list, the elements could be spread anywhere in the memory in the other space of that process. We don't care where. Okay, so one element could be here, another element could be there. That's not the problem. The important thing is, I know the first element, and the first element has what we call a link or a pointer showing us where the second one is. So I go to the second one, and it tells me where the third one is, and that tells me where the fourth one is. So this way, actually, I can find uh, the uh, alternative uh, solutions. So this one will circumvent the second disadvantage we mentioned. Uh, now, list is a new type, but we need a more generic type than the array list and uh, the linked list. So we will talk about a more generic type called a collection, and then implement the collection in different ways. We will be implementing it as a list or a bag or a stack, queue, set, map, or graph. In this chapter, we will be focusing on list, stack, queue, set, and map. So, uh, the Java Collections framework provides us with the uh, structure for this. In the Java Collections framework, we have actually two uh, different approaches. One is the collection, and the other one is the map. Now, uh, in the figure, you see both of them. So, for the moment, let's just focus on the one on the left, which is the collection. Don't look at map for the moment. So, collection itself is implemented as an interface. Uh, but it's actually extended into list or stack interfaces. Again, uh, list and set, uh, so not stack, set, they're both interfaces. List could be implemented either as an array list, as you discussed, or a linked list. We also briefly discussed the linked list. Set, we didn't discuss yet, will be implemented as a hash set and tree set. On, now, we're going to discuss these in the following slides in detail. 
when we are done with the discussion of collections we will come to the map interface which could be implemented as hash map and tree map the map and the collection are closely related but they're different but because of that relation we are just showing them in a single slide now we are going to refer to this slide several times in this chapter to remember this relationship between these and uh, remind where we are in the chapter.